Well, I've got to loosen this up a bit. Um, I'm certain that what I'm going to talk about uh, will be interesting to you, and it might also be presented at a pace that you either think is too slow or too fast. So right off the top, could we find out how many people here do a lot of JavaScript programming, first of all? OK. And uh, how many of the rest of you know HTML at all in any capacity? And XML? OK, cool. And just for kicks, Python or Ruby or some language like that. OK, good. It seems like we are talking to a pretty technical audience. Um, so final question is object-oriented programming in general. How many of you understand objects, classes, inheritance? Everybody. This is going to be fun. OK. <laughs> So my presentation tonight is on object-oriented HTML. And I'd like to define what that means before I go any further, because it'd be very simple to mistake it for any one of a number of things. I don't mean prototype and JavaScript. I, I don't mean the class.js inheritance. I don't mean anything with JavaScript in particular. I'm talking about treating uh, HTML uh, tags as objects. Uh, which they are. I, I suppose DOM goes without saying that, that all of you are familiar at least with what, a do, what the DOM is and methods because XML sort of implies the DOM. So you all might know, and if anyone doesn't know, I'd like to know now, that when you create a tag in an HTML application, you are able to navigate to that tag, whether you use jQuery or selectors or whatever, and at that point that tag has attributes. Uh, just like any object would in JavaScript. So you can write JavaScript code that's able to navigate to that DOM item or that HTML tag, however you like to perceive it, and uh, modify it. So I'm going to set up my laptop here really quick. But what I would like to do is draw an equivalence between object-oriented programming that you might see in Python to what we have when we're looking at an HTML tag. So let's start it. And that's PC2, right? So uh, I just typed this up quickly. It's not actually a working program. Uh, it's <coughs> supposed to be Python, but if you don't know Python, uh, I'm sure it is self-evident that I'm at least trying to create an object here. Uh, we see that we have a class, and then the class has methods. Uh, and then the class itself, when it's created, is initialized by these statements, uh, which means when we're done, if we create this object by saying foo, then we'll end up with an object f that has an attribute do something, which you can call, and an attribute something else, which you can call, as well as bar, which will equal high, and baz, which is equal to there. So we're all familiar with that, hopefully. And we know <laughs> that you can write Python so that you can take two classes and put them together. You can change what attributes are on this here. You could use self in this statement to further change the object. And hopefully, that's not introducing anything new. Um, so let's have a look then at an HTML document, which I'll type in the same area. I will present a nice PowerPoint demonstration slide halfway through this, hopefully. But for the moment, bear with me as we do a little bit of manual typing. So we know that an HTML document starts with the HTML tag and the body tag. I'll put them in there just, for, just this once. You'll find me excerpt them most of the time because they're not required to the larger idea. And here we have a div which has the content high there in it, which is text. So at this point in time, whether or not it's uh, evident, we have created an object. It's a div tag. And it has a child object, uh, which is a text node, which isn't you know, shown as a tag, but is just implied by their text being inside of it. So if I navigated to this using some uh, fake me out JavaScript, which is to say it's not necessary that it really works. I just want to get the idea across. If I say ID equals tag, then here you might be aware that, I could, that there are attributes on this tag. Um, one of them might be uh, width or height, or it might be inner HTML, or it might be any one of a number of, of elements that you can come across. Unless it's important for someone for me to demonstrate that, I'm just going to presume that you know they exist. 
So when you do object-oriented programming, as we see up here, it's important to be able to assign attributes. It's important to be able to assign methods to make them do things. Now, when we do this in HTML, and we do do it, we do it in a nonlinear way. Basically, we take a script tag and put it somewhere inside of our document. And then, if we have access to the script tag, we'll make logic that affects it. So we might say, using jQuery, uh, height. And what that actually does, of course, is apply CSS. Now, CSS uses the word class. So don't get confused between object-oriented programming classes and CSS classes. Uh, you may see me use both, but I'm definitely talking about object-oriented programming on the topic that I'm about to discuss, not CSS classes. Um, so here we find that the presentation and the logic are separated. Now that's valuable in programming because it lets logic people do place in one place and it lets designers have something in another place. And, and that's one of the powers of HTML is that separation. That being said, when you create complex widgetry components, you find that your code is split between regions. As a matter of fact, when you come to a programming uh, code base that you've never worked with before, by definition, you have to examine the entirety of that code base to be sure there isn't some piece of code somewhere doing something to the HTML that you're looking at. For HTML and an application page may be affected by any script tag, no matter how it's included at whatever point it might be included, whether by script tag, source, HTTP, whatever. So all I'm trying to point out without getting into my solution yet is that we have a difficulty in HTML programming of describing objects, their attributes, methods, what they do, and where that information goes. And that separation, some would say, is to enforce separation from presentation and, and logic, and they don't think about it anymore, past just that claim. Well, it turns out it's not true, that you need to separate your code and your presentation to have separation of code and presentation. They can be related spatially. They can be in the same place. So the benefit of the technique that I'll be describing here is in a syntax and a runtime that allows an HTML page like you're used to to have a syntax that lets you write code right there in a way that is uh, immediate, not only in your ability to write it, but to someone who comes to the web page, because some, or your code base, pardon me, someone who comes to your code base will be able to see right in the HTML that defines something that something's being done to it. Just like object-oriented programming, if you want to find a method on an object, you look at the method, the object's definition, and you can see code. So I'm just going to jump right in and then find out if what I'm doing makes sense. And if it does, I'll go down one path, and if it doesn't, I'll go down another. So let's say that I have a div, and what I want to do is give this div an attribute foo, just like we see uh, up here. As a matter of fact, I'll call this class div. And then I'm intuiting that I want to create this class down here. Uh, we don't need a script tag. What we do have, and I'll explain later, is a runtime that goes through the page and by looking at the syntax here, gives it these features. To recreate what we had up top, it would look like this. Now everything you're seeing here actually works. It's not a hypothetical, uh, but I'm just not running it yet because I'd like to establish the, the basis here for what we're seeing and what it does. Okay, so we'll presume that we uh, pass out of that, and, you know, that we would do something there. So what we have now uh, is, I hope, recognizably the exact same structure that we had in the object-oriented programming above the Python. We have a div, we have what appears to be a key value pair, um, and if it makes more sense, imagine squiggly brackets at the start and the bottom. I'm going to put that in for you, it's automatically put there, but uh, imagine that there were squiggly brackets. Now when I say squiggly brackets, I mean JavaScript notation for objects. Does anyone here not know the JavaScript notation for objects and how this squiggly bracket starts an object and this one ends it and that this is a key and that this is a value. Is everyone comfortable with that? So in that case, 
I'm going to remove these. You're going to remember this rule to interpret this code. Any text that is a text child of a div will be interpreted this way. And I'm misleading you slightly, because not every div in this document would have that association occur. As a matter of fact, if I did that on every div, you wouldn't be able to write normal HTML, because where would you put your text? So CSS, pardon this slight diversion, is used for what? Styling documents. That's actually not true. CSS is a way of finding nodes, and then it also gives you a way of applying attributes to them, such as use CSS to find a node with class red and then put color red on it. So I'm going to do something that most people aren't familiar with, and yet it's not outside the scope of CSS at all. I'm going to use it to indicate that a node should have a behavior applied, a function, logic, not styling. So I'm going to add a class, and I'm going to call that class name tag. Uh, and the name name tag is significant. We'll get into why later. When a div has class name tag, this rule applies. Any naked text inside of it will be interpreted as key value pairs that instantiate it. Any HTML inside of that tag will be outputted as normal. So in this case, we'd have a div whose ID is tag with a span high there, and then that div would then have the attributes do something, something else, and when it was created, it would have high and there. So in this one stroke, we have found a method for defining logic in line with our code, and that's really important because of recursion, something that I'll get to in a second. But this is evident what this code does now. So coder coming to this page for the first time, even with as little introduction as we've had, it should, it should be evident that we are setting variables and that we have functions that can run. So uh, in our script tag above, were we to make it again, we could get a reference to the tag node, and we could say tag do something and run it say tag do something else and run it. So one of the interesting features of this language is that like object-oriented programming, it's recursive. When you create a Python object, in the initialization statement, you're able to say self.f equals div. And we'll notice that I called the uh, class div here, not class foo, but up at the top it's class div. So this line is really interesting. Uh, this would be an infinite loop, by the way, but it illustrates the point that you're able to assign a class instance as an attribute to a class. So in Python, you have a recursive structure. And when you write an HTML page, you have a recursive structure. Three divs inside of each other aren't markup. They're not boxes. That Yes, they have look, but that's, that's, an, that's an effect of the browser. It's not what it is from a computer science point of view. If you have three divs inside of each other, you now have an object that gets instantiated with another object inside of it that gets instantiated with a third object. And if it doesn't have a name, there's just no way to get to it except for CSS. But it gets made. You can tell because you can see, see it on the page. So uh, to illustrate that point here, I'm going to copy what we just did with this. And I'm going to place it inside of this text. And this is uh, not re infinitely recursive. This is a perfectly valid program. Uh, we see again at top, we have class name tag, which makes this text. This associates values on the div. This is then the XML content. Why do we know this is XML content? Because it's an XML tag. It's not naked text. This is naked text. This is an XML tag. This XML tag is also annotated with the class name tag. So again, it can have methods on top of it, uh, culminating then in the original span. So now we have a div inside of a div, and the attributes and methods are there. Have I appropriately established the relationship between Python or Ruby or another interpreted object-oriented language and the capability of HTML to be written in the same way? Does, and be honest, because I would love to revisit it in a different way if necessary. Does it seem uh, impossible or wrong to represent HTML this way? It may not be common. It may not be the way you think of it. But is there anything wrong with it on a philosophical level? What's performing? Uh, it's a runtime that is loaded into the page via um, you know, JavaScript. Wait, and browsers after, are executing it without a JavaScript plugin? It's not a plug, well, it's loaded right, JavaScript. Plugin, but a JavaScript. Uh, on ready of the page. The page is then scanned. So, so this is, you don't need 
bring in some library. It's you do need to bring in a library. Which that library then on ready of the page treats the rest of your page in this fashion. Asking which library? That's the library I offered I'll be releasing in a week. Oh, okay. So this is not available yet. Um, as a matter of fact, speaking with you guys gives me an opportunity to judge which parts are uh, easily understood and, and which aren't. So now, when is it the init function gets run? Is it when the page loads? It just <coughs> reads that and knows it needs to run the init, or what? Mm -hmm. and, well, I will get more specific. This isn't actually a good example. It illustrates the structure. I will make a fully formed example presently. Okay. Uh, that being said, this runs on ready of the page. jQuery is ready to be exact, and jQuery is loaded in even if you don't need to use it. Uh, but the runtime that I bring in is responsible for visiting the node with class name tag parsing, this is text, and turning it into key values where the values are assigned under those keys to the div, and then continuing on. So from your point of view, you can now write code that does this, and you don't really matter how. It just works. From the point of view of a coder, we can talk about that, um, and it's interesting. So I'd like to, if there, if there are any other questions, I'd love to take those. If there aren't, I will show a working program as it needs to be written to truly work. Please. So you said that the first div basically identifies that um, the text immediately following is is scripting. Because it's text. You'll see that this right. is not an XML tag. So it is naked text, and because there's a class name tag, it will be treated that way. If there was no class name tag, it would just be a normal tag the way that you understand it. With class name tag, only direct child nodes of that tag will be treated differently. But when you nest another div inside, then it treats it differently. It knows that this is XML, so this is not a text node. It's not a direct descendant. It is now uh, an XML node. And if you understand XML, you could imagine a text node is a, is a tag without the tag, so to speak. It's an object. So when I look at this tag, I'm able to say, this is text. Do something with it. This is XML. Do something else. Okay, so I I don't code XML, but I understand scripting. So they actually do different things. They're not dependent on each other. They don't. Well, they, they they provide for different in initialization. This initializes attributes on this div. Uh -huh. This is merely the content of that div, as it would be a normal HTML. I mean, when you have when you write a div inside of a div you are instructing it to create an object inside of the other object. It's just not something we think about. We see them as boxes on the screen. We don't see them as objects that, that are malleable, that are customizable. So um, this is by far not the point. This is to get us on the page. But the reason it's called name tag is because it gives names to tags. We'll get to that in a second. Go ahead. In the real world, you wouldn't show the ID names, but it's a tag. I wouldn't use IDs at all. As a matter of fact, if you're using IDs in your code, I hope after today's demonstration you never will again. It's a good question. IDs, of course, only let you uh, have one in the page. So were I to define a structure that could be created recursively, I'd have more than one ID tag. That's not true. You can have more than one ID. You can. It's just overwritten, and it's not. Uh, it's not sensible from a from a person who doesn't know your code. Right. Nobody validates. Well, everything. you'll enjoy what I do next because it gets rid of the need for names. But I wanted to introduce something which is available. Um, I'll put out cards later. There's a site, DOM Algebra, that has examples that talks about this more. Um, and you're all welcome to visit that after the talk if you'd like to you know, pick apart some of the details I bring up here. Uh, one of the things available on that site is something called Shimmel, a shorthand markup language. And it's something I wrote. Because if you identify XML as being a means of defining object-oriented code, the one thing that gets annoying really quick that you don't have to do in Python is write end tags. Right? You open a div, you close a div. Okay. So I just want to establish what Shimmel is because all the examples I'm going to show you from here on out use it, and it's very simple to understand. Uh, in Shimmel, and you are looking at a real live program, I will prove it by showing you the output. There's hi here, and there's hi down here, so I can say hi there, save it, run it, great. So you'll notice there are no closed tags in this code. And um, that's because I'm processing it. So that's a convenience. I type less, you read less, we all win. So you'll see that a div is open here, has no close tag. It is closed automatically because the next <coughs> line doesn't isn't indented. Same thing here, this is a script tag. It's closed because there's nothing underneath of it. This is a div tag, it's closed, there's nothing underneath of it. Does anyone have a problem with that? I tend to find it's very natural for me. 
Does anyone have any issues with that? That's great. I was kind of hoping people would say. It requires an indentation line up. Absolutely. And as a matter of fact, I want to point out that this, well, first of all, I'm, I'm being slightly disingenuous. I wrote two versions, one in Python, one in JavaScript. So you're looking at the Python version, and this dialect shimmel tells my web, my web server to treat the whole page as shimmel. There is another version that runs in JavaScript by itself, web page. So just don't get too confused by that. Just understand that it is shimmel, and when you don't see closed tags, there's a reason, and yes, it's white space indented, in like, like you've noticed. So, um, I wanted to point out something you don't normally see unless you're familiar with templating systems like knockout underscore. Has anyone here worked with uh, HTML templating systems like jQuery templates? All right. So this is based on jQuery templates, but I modified it, which means that it does stuff and works in ways uh, John Resnick never intended. As a matter of fact, he has a highly successful project on his hands, and he stopped supporting it because he didn't know what he wrote. That's my personal feeling. So I just wanted to point out that I reserved text slash name tag to indicate that this is a script tag that doesn't contain JavaScript. It contains my language name tag. Given, we see we have this, which I don't intend to describe right now. We have this, which is like a knit, an opportunity to do something when the tag is made. And like previous, we have a div, content, that will get painted. So this I don't intend to explain either, except that there's a focus system. What I would like to do is show you some quick examples down here that talk about the power of the system and the point of doing this. So first of all, if I wanted to turn this into a name tag, as we discussed, I put class name tag here. And then I could turn that into span. And then I could say on load alert high. So I run it, I get an alert. Now, typing class name tag, that gets a little boring. It's a lot, you know, it's hard to pick out. So first of all, this isn't a script tag, guys. This isn't in the actual HTML page. This is the only real div in the whole page. Let's look at what it does. It has class name tag, which means it'll be processed specially. It has some other CSS. I call these verbs. There's nothing special here. It's just CSS classes, in this case with width 100, with this case position fixed. App BG is just a background, it's just a color. So there's nothing magic going on there. If you knew the CSS that I wrote, these would all make perfect sense. One thing that's different is this script environment tag. Well, here's where start that some of the fun starts to kick in. If you have a class name tag, you can assign values you can write in the tag, great. If you say script environment, you can reference something else that gets instantiated there, like multiple inheritance and object oriented. You know that when you write a Python class, and if you don't, well, I could explain it. When you write a Python class, you're able to inherit. So think of this word environment as saying that this tag should inherit from this one. So this div has a load, and it has div inside of it now. And that's where this comes from. That's why that worked. So this gets boring to type. Notice that I'm not in the actual HTML page. I'm in the script tag. That means I get to process it. That means I get to do things to it that may not be valid HTML. Five or four, it doesn't matter. It has to end up that way. What the browser sees must be valid HTML. But what I do in here doesn't have to be. So I'm going to show you the first rule of name tag that we like to use. Exactly equivalent. This turns into div class name tag. So if you're familiar with iOS programming, if you're familiar with Java and Android programming, you know that they do what's called view-based programming. And that is a means by which you can make a box that has a generic outlay of opportunity, very much like an XML document. As a matter of fact, there's very little difference between programming iOS and making views and an HTML document with all divs. It's the same thing. They get you on the names. So view to me means class name tag. Now, I can put classes on here like you'd expect. So I can say class red and Pardon me. Get rid of that. Yeah, there's nothing on the page here because I didn't put high. So, no. Right? And so now we see red. So um, I just wanted to point out that there's no view tag in HTML. Yes, I'm pre processing it. That pre processing does a lot of neat stuff. So, what we're going to do is create our name tag for the first time. And we're going to do that by copying the script tag. 
and we're going to call it our tag. And inside of here, we're going to say div class light blue gradient padded hi there. I know the alert's so annoying. I just want to do it at first to prove that this is all happening. We'll abandon that. So uh, I'm going to run the page and nothing will change because I wrote a new script tag, R tag, but I'm not invoking it anywhere. So again, there's two ways to invoke it. There's the way that makes sense from an HTML point of view, and then there's the way that looks nice, which is equivalent. So uh, pardon me while I put these on either side, and I'll... Uh, I can bring this up and dock it so that we can see if anything goes wrong. Um, so what I'm going to do down here is invoke it. I'll get rid, I have hit a span here, that's great. Well, I can put anything I want. So I'm going to say div class name tag script our tag. Notice no close tag because of shimmel. I run it again, it says hi, and then I get hi there. So before I go on, Anyone getting lost by this? Do I need to explain something again? Because you all seem like you're doing great, which is rewarding for me to see. No? OK. So the script tag indicates, of course, that as a name tag, it should inherit from the script, our tag. But we have this text preprocessing. So we can say the exact same thing by just saying our tag. And in that case, same thing comes up, and it knew that this wasn't an HTML5 tag name or an HTML tag name. I maintain a big list of what those are. And if it's not in the list, then it has to be that. So it, it literally replaces put script equals r tag on it, and we can move on. So uh, you can have multiples of those. You can have them inside of them. I'm going to get rid of the alert here for fun. Uh, what I am going to do then is use something for the first time called text replacement, val. And here I'm going to say r tag val equals hi there with the exclamation mark. And I'm actually going to turn it into buff, which stands for buffer. It's just generic whatever. And we'll run it again. We see we have the initial hi there, uh, r tag. We have hi there here, so that was kind of redundant, right? Let's make this better. Message. We have our span, but you believe me that that's HTML, so we don't need that twice. We'll put it in there twice. And on the second one, we'll say hello. So uh, now we have an interesting thing. One of several I want to introduce quickly, but I do recognize for time purposes I can't possibly cover everything this does in you know, the 30 minutes that I have. However, uh, we see then that you can pass a variable here that was defined on the tag to here. That's text replacement. If you use the jQuery or any of the other systems, they all have different ways of doing it. jQuery, for instance, makes it look like that. Uh, other ones that we're familiar with use the percent tag and make it look like that. Why do I like the one I chose? Because it doesn't mess up XML parsers. Because it's not used anywhere. No one ever naturally types bracket equals. If you look at JavaScript, it's, it's an impossible character. I also think it looks nice. So forgive my you know, artistic liberty license there. But you will recognize that that is replacing it. So you can do a lot of stuff here. You could say. You know, plus it's a JavaScript statement. You could have in a real script tag, which is to say JavaScript, var something equals yo. And then down here, you could have said plus something, unlike other templating languages. And this is why jQuery templates is better than some of the other ones, in my opinion. You can do this sort of global access. Many templating languages on purpose got rid of that, thinking that the scope was better maintained and it makes a better piece of code, maybe for their point of view, maybe for their cases. But being able to reference things like this is entirely fun. So I want to show that what you see down here is equivalent in form to the other syntax I showed you. said, do I have to write what? In the so when you went back up and you added the different variables, yeah. they're all within the same div, but you can call them if, even if they're different divs? 
anytime this tag is invoked, if this tag has a variable defined on it, then that replacement will print it out. This exists because I defined it here. This exists because I defined it globally. Therefore, putting it together, we get both out of it. Does that answer that your question? That makes sense inside of like everything's in that same div, though. In div, this could only be text output. It is in this div. We put it out twice. So this tag resolves into a div with class name tag, a div with light blue gradient padded, and then buff high there. To prove it, I'll put a class on the instance. But if I so, have a different div at the same level of this div, can I still call each other? I guess you can if you converge the DOM or whatever. <laughs> I think you find that you can do what you're asking. Okay. Yeah. As a matter of fact, one of the things I'm very proud about is that this is a full recursive solution, and it does some amazing things by being a full recursive solution. So that's interesting. I mean, you know, we've got a way of doing templating that lets you design your templates right there in your document. Why is that important? First of all, there's a difference between anonymous objects and, and named objects. In Python, there's no such thing as an anonymous object. To create an object, you have to give it a name. If you just say foo, it's going to die when, when the method that created it exited. You have to say self dot something equals the object, and then it knows to retain it because it's an attribute on the object. My point is when you're creating user interfaces, you don't want to give a name to everything. Maybe it's just a box for decoration's sake. You don't need to access it. So being able to define a nested recursive structure where you don't have to name everything is actually of a great deal of importance to this type of work. But I'm going to skip on. If we all are comfortable with that, and it's amazing that we are, I'm going to uh, do a couple things that actually make this fun. I don't intend to describe all of it. I'm sure you'll have some questions, but I want to show some of the things it can do used appropriately. Um, first of all, I call these options down here. So that's the option buff. It was the option load. It was the option init. Um, some of those options are special. They will tell the runtime to do something to that tag that uh, may seem magical, isn't defined anywhere else. Our first magical uh, thing will be list. So well, that's an option. All it is going to do is put an attribute called list on, on the tag. So you know we make the div, our, our tag, and then it has list equals. Now I wrote this function range. It's the same as in Python. It's going to return a list 0 through 9. That's all. But it instructs the runtime to do something very interesting. And it was telling me there that I have a JavaScript problem. Buff is no longer defined in this because this is now a list. So let's simplify this. That made perfect sense. I just don't feel like describing that right at the moment. Yeah, I know. Sorry, I got to get rid of the reference here. OK, so now I get 10 of them. Um, and I have no idea why it's asking me to translate things. I've never seen that before. In any case, uh, so just because I hope this is obvious, I can then say I. I have no idea why it's asking me this. Yeah, it's never happened. No, I, I mean, I've run a million programs in this. I've never once seen that come up. I can, oh, you know what? My keyboard is sticky, so sometimes it does an alt combination, a meta key combination when I don't need it to. So that's what that is. OK, so we just made a list with nothing more than you know writing this and then this. We got 10 of those out, and that's really nice. I mean, listing is everything in UI. So when, you know, if we look at a web page, well, anything. If we look at this UI, and I, I, I hope this is valuable if you haven't thought of it before. If you've all thought of it, you know, let me know to move on. But everything in this UI is a list. I mean, the OSX UI, not, not mine. If you look here, we have a list of tabs. We have a list of buttons. We have a list of buttons. We have, obviously, this list. We have a list of widgets. We have a list of lines. We have a list of menu items. We have a list of tabs. Everything in a UI is a list, even if it's a list with one item in it. So if you don't give the list I option to this, you can think of it as a list with one item. Uh, that's a convenience. I actually call them without the list structural and with the list list. But anyway, let's get on to some cooler things that it does. Um, there's code that you really don't want to have to write all the time. What is that code? Well, being able to select a list. Quick, anyone answer. In HTML, you want to make it so that a user can click on an entry in a list you make. and 
Uh, if they double click on it, something happens. How do you do it? I'm not saying it's impossible. Anyone? Okay. You do it with jQuery click handler. And so what you would say is all the LIs inside of me would now get a behavior. The problem with that is there's 10 ways to do it, literally. Is it jQuery? Is it this? Is it all the LIs? Is it by name? Is it everything in your document? There's a lot of different ways to do it. The problem with the UI that has so many different ways to define behavior is that no two programmers are going to write compatible behavior. And that means on a large project, you're all but guaranteed your code isn't going to play along nicely with someone else's. So first of all, I'm going to say selectable, light yellow, uh, and we might as well use green. And what that option does is tell it a CSS class. Save it. Oh, it won't work because the gradient's on there. Pardon me. So now we have a list. And you see I can click it. And I can alt click it to select multiple items. OK. Well, first of all, that saves a lot of time because Lord only knows we, we have to do this all the time. So. Uh, let's say what I wanted to have happen is whenever something has selection, uh, it gets printed out into the console, and we'll bring this console back up. Well, the uh, double underscores that we saw here with double underscore load are called delegates because they react to something. So load, load is a method that, that happens when something loads, so something else calls load. So I hope with that same logic that if I write a second one with double underscores called selection, it then becomes obvious when this method is called. This method is called when an item has selection. So um, I know this, um, we're going to go increasingly faster so that I can get to my PowerPoint presentation, which you know, finishes this up. This is all by way of introduction to the topic. Um, this is a delegate selection that when one and only one item is selected will run. There's also selected, there's unselected, there's unselection. If I bring up the file browser, You'll see that if I select two items, there's nothing here because it, it, it doesn't know what to do. There's more than one item. But if I select one item, uh, which would be a file, you know, in this case, it knows what to do because this item had selection. Okay, show it. So I just wanted to point out that the generic concepts of selection and unselection and selected and selected, they're deep. It's not like my way of doing it. It's the way of doing it. And if your framework doesn't expose it, that's not my fault. The idea that we all need that, that's global. There's no UI you've ever made that didn't utilize that concept. So I find it to be really important to have defined it in a way that you know, is easily graspable, easy to understand. So if we come back to this and we reload it, now you see when I click one, it prints out its index. If I select two, it didn't because all of those were there. Great. If I go back to one, it prints it out. So let's go a little faster now. Key selectable. True. And now with that one line, I can use my keyboard. I'm not using the mouse. And I can select all and select none. Uh, as a matter of fact, I can have two of those on the screen. You'll see I have one down here. I'm going to get rid of this view class red that I have. Just leave that R tag there. And now we'll run it. And we see we have a tag. OK. Well, one last thing before I go to the PowerPoint. Hitches, so much fun. It is the JavaScript complement to CSS. Uh, there's a problem with web page design. Uh, there is no way to algorithmically specify the width and height of something. Oh, you can say 50%. You can give it an exact figure. But you can't say be a third of the size of something else. You can't say your size should be derived from a call to a server. So. I'm going to illustrate in a really quick example how to make two of these on the screen so that they are each half the size of the screen and stay that way, where the keys that you use have focus, which of course is what this focus line here is, is about in the first place, although that's just boilerplate. So what I'm going to do is say width. And I'm not going to explain this yet. I will type it out first. Sorry, height. Two. I want height here as well. And I am going to copy that twice, except on the bottom one, I am going to say, look. OK, so it starts to get interesting. Uh, notice, by the way, you can see it because there was no overflow. So what I need to do is say uh, uh, no overflow. Right? So now we see 
that we have a div vertically oriented. And if I click on this one, I can the keyboard uses that. You'll see it's cycling through. If I go down to this one, then the focus has that and it's cycling through. Now, I'm not being able to scroll in either of these, right? Well, in this model, it's a lot nicer. By the way, that's why I needed the no overflow because I didn't put scrollable on it. So we're going to get rid of the no overflow, put scrollable, come back and reload it. And now we see that we have two separately reloadable lists. And uh, just for fun and games, man, my last uh, my last topic here would be to make one of these, make its height half of that. Now uh, the tag inside of it. Uh, will be the height of its parent, and uh, I prefer to format it like so, forgive me. Just so that we can all clearly read what's going on there. Now I'm going to make a second R tag, and it's not its height that I want to change, it's its width. So now I can say value divided by two. Notice I'm not really taking time to define that syntax. It you know, sort of makes sense, and there's definitely rules about it, all of that. But I hope that it at least makes sense that I'm taking whatever self.parent height is and dividing it by 2. So uh, then at the width, I'm sorry, is done that way. Then I should have this. And now I need the same thing, height. And this should just be the height of its parent. Same thing here. And if I did everything correctly, which isn't always a given, let's see. So this is the height, and its width is 100, and then we have the div, and its height is there. I think we might have to give it relative, and then we'll say green here. Its width is the self-parent width. Oh, there is no parent width. Um, I'm not going to get into how you could write that better. I just want it to be understandable. So in this case, it's self.parent.width, and the parent didn't have a width. So I hope that that was. Yeah, thanks. I wish I could code with you all normally. I, if I was a billionaire, I would pay you all to sit there and watch me. That would be insanely fun. So let's see. We have well, the height is divided by 2. The width is the parent width. And then we have the height is self.parent height, uh, which should be divided by 2. And then the width is divided by 2. There's something on basic I'm forgetting, which happens a lot. Uh, obviously, what I'm looking for is to have two of them on top of each other. I'm not actually going to spend a lot of time on this. here so that I can see what's going on. And we see that its height is not being correctly set here. Oh, <laughs> and the answer is obvious, by the way. Notice that I'm using a div, but it's not class name tag. So there, the hitch isn't going to work because it's not a name tag. I wanted to save you. And so now I get two of them side by side, and there should be a third one, except I said rel, so it's wrapping. What I want to do is make them absolute. ABS, ABS, ABS. And now, um, actually, so what I'd like to do is make them relative, but in such a way. So I'll make this simpler, left, self, dot parent, dot width, value 2. So that's just going to say it's left should be its width divided by 2, which as we know, we'll put it there. So now we get the two on top, and then we want the one on the bottom again, which has uh, its height, but it is absolute. So we need to say that its top is the same thing. We need to say top. And we want that. So top is self dot parent dot height uh, value divided by two. I think we have to say yeah, we have to say um, abs or relative for top to work. And it bothers me a little bit that it's not working, but I'm really not going to spend time on it. What's happening uh, is that CSS box model is pushing the other one off the screen. And if I get rid of the padding, then it will work. 
So let's get rid of the title. So now we see that worked out fine, and then there should be one on the bottom, uh, which is absolute and self parent by height, and then its height is, uh, and then that should all work. I don't really care why it's not working. So, well, I do care. But not in such a way that I should spend a lot of time on it. There's something just as simple going on here. I'm making. Oh, you know what? That might very well be it. Oh, that's not it. So in Shimmel, you can just comment out stuff with double slash. You can't do that in HTML. Just pointing out. We see that it's not showing up at all, which is highly suspicious. Oh, see that? See the, the error there? No, I have a close tag there. Shouldn't be. So there it is. Bring this, it was just a syntax error for what it's worth. And we all fall prey to that. So now I can make these different colors to call them out. Red, green, uh, purple, and orange, since I'm using green for the highlighting. And then we see we have that. Also notice that you can size the screen, and it all runs really fast and really beautifully. So, the point of that is, first of all, that runs way faster than you think it does. Like, there's no, CSS is faster. Yes and no. You use hitches to define a region in which CSS applies to that region, which means CSS can then base all of its operations off of this container. You use hitches to give an absolute value to a region. And then with that absolute value, CSS is then localized to that area so that your styles make sense. That's the whole point of this, is that if you have a page where nothing inside of it is given in terms of absolute pixels, CSS doesn't work the way you want it to. But if you give absolute pixels, now it's one fixed size, and it doesn't change. So pitches give CSS what it needs, an absolute value, in such a way that it responds to the size of the screen and subcomponents. So part of the fun here, then, would be to take this entire structure that I just made and then play it again inside of here. And I'm not going to use our tag. Uh, because that would change stuff. I'm going to make it a view. That view then is now spaced to have the top on the bottom. And the content of that will then be what I wrote above. So who knows what it's really going to do? Well, let's have some fun. Make it a tree map. <laughs> yep. So, uh, yeah, again, there's no width on the top one. So put that there. And I'm not telling you about root, which would let you get a width or a height without going to your parent, but going to the first thing above you with a width or a height. That's more complex than I feel this example deserves. So now we see two of them, and then we can flip the orange and the purple. So what was the point of that? I wanted to prove that it's recursive, hitches inside of hitches inside of hitches. So this program can now be, this program that we wrote can be turned into a component. And, and this is where it gets fun. This is the last bit I promise before we get to anything else. I'm going to copy all of that out and put it into a new tag. And so what we're going to do is copy our R tag thing here. ID equals uh, next tag, whatever. And we need, we definitely need to give the indentation properly. Right. I believe that that's correct. It is. Uh, and then we need to say type text name tag. And uh, now with the next tag, we have defined the structure. So we're going to make two of them. The first one we'll, um, we'll copy from what I did here. Uh, we're just going to say that the height of this is the divided by two. That's all I really need to do, I believe, if I'm wrong. So again, that's the box model wrapping. If I, oh, it should be divided by two, of course. And it's possible that I have to put something else in there. So there's the top one, and then uh, say class eight, yes. Yeah, okay, so I'm not gonna get into all that, but if I did it, you would then see eight of them, doesn't matter. 
So let's stop there. I want to take questions in a broad sense. This has introduced a lot of new concepts. Is there anything you find unbelievable, or do you have reservations about how this fits in to how you write programs? I want to point out that every program you've written, you could drop this library into it right now with no change. Then you could introduce this code into your current project with no change, except for introducing my component. So a component written this way can be injected into any project that you have right now without any consequence, uh, which is really important because it gives a way for one designer to fully communicate a program to another designer, guaranteeing that the namespace that designer uses isn't polluted. It's not global. The namespace is local to the widget that you wrote. So in this case, I have an, an environment tag. Fine, I have next tag. I guess my point is that this next tag thing is entirely local. The code that I wrote is local to that tag. So were I to copy and paste this tag and give it to someone else, there would be no further question about how to run it. You put that thing in your page, you put next tag in there, that's it. There is no global variables to go wrong. There is no uh, variables which need to be aligned. And that's one of the big problems. How do you add code to a project you currently have without accidentally polluting its namespace, without knowing what the code is you wrote. I mean, you can't just arbitrarily take a project online and put it into your code, can you? You have to find out if they use the variable name foo, and you use foo, so. Uh, so how do you go back and make local changes once you've componentized all this in your code? Well, you can just go back to the component and change it, and then it would change everywhere. So, um, I feel, at this point, uh, that it may, in fact, be redundant to show you this PowerPoint, but let's try it anyway. I'll page through it quite quickly. Okay, thank you, whatever. Go here, play. Right, okay, so um, I did give this once before, but they didn't have the benefit of everything I've just told you. So I'm guessing that this made no sense. I'm hoping that it makes more sense now. Why is it combinatoric application development? Because you can inject any amount of code into a project with any amount of code and have them continue to work. Uh, so I'll just go over these quickly. Uh, obviously, it's nice to have components. You saw me use list selection. You saw me use events. Uh, and of course, it includes code written normally. It doesn't at all impact the code you've already written. You can have your strip tags. You can have your libraries. You can have whatever. It works. Uh, you can write applications through the web. Well, uh, the last presenter gave uh, an ID. It talked about web IDs. I've got one too, so we're going to talk about that in a bit. Um, crowdsource your code base. Well, if your customers can give you components, if they can author components, then you can integrate work that they've developed to use your page better, and they can give it back to you. We'll see about that in a second. Uh, it's important to be able to deploy your application next to other applications without seeing their code. Something we'll prove in a second. Uh, it does reduce your time to market by quite a bit. Okay, it's marketing, who cares? So, um, these are all things that should just reinforce what you saw. HTML has no built-in method of including more HTML. Now, Doctor Who's advice was don't play. I don't know if he was talking about Chrome's new browser. Um, they may at one point have web components figured out. When they do, doesn't mean everyone else is. The cool thing about the way I've done it is it's W3C, JavaScript all the way, it, it would run in a browser from four years ago. As a matter of fact, there's nothing HTML5 about this. It's just JavaScript and DOM. Um, so we can include HTML. Uh, I showed that putting things in it, putting your variables. Go ahead. Including more HTML is another request to the server? No, sir. There is no way. I mean, you can document .write code that you got from the server, and that's what Ajax is. But if you do it, uh, there is no cohesion between them. It's just a piece of code. There's no like namespace. There's no repeatability. It's just a chunk of code. And that code can't run script tags, as far as I know. If you do write XML to your document, I'm not even sure script tags run. And if they do run, they run right away. There's a raft of problems. With it. However, think about the link tag. Think about the style tag. There is no equivalent for HTML. You can import CSS in an HTML page. You can import uh, JavaScript from a page. But you cannot import more HTML from a page, especially at the initial page load. Anyway, uh, good question. No questions, OK. Um, and uh, so I thought a lot about how to solve these problems, obviously. Um, so this thing is based on jQuery, jQuery templates. 
You saw that it writes things recursively, which no other templating system on the planet has, including AngularJS and all of that stuff. No recursion. Recursion is important because then you can take out an entire application and put it as a, I mean, that's the whole idea of decomposition requires recursion. So it's not a small thing. Um, and you saw that we annotate it simply by writing you know, attributes inside of there. So you saw this class name tag uh, and how that works, so we can skip that. Uh, we saw putting attributes in there, we can skip that. Uh, I didn't talk about CSS, it's one of the cooler things. Notice that there's a style tag here, right? Well, this is self, what is self? I replace that. So when you write CSS this way, this will write CSS that will always be local to the script that you're writing. And, and so that way you can actually deploy an application that's everything in one place. But that's inline styles then. Uh, actually, this, is, uh, this would confuse you. Um, I hope it makes more sense in just a little bit because this is actually being written in my IDE and therefore this style tag is pre-processed out. It doesn't actually get to the document. I do stuff with it before it, before it gets there. Um, uh, we'll skip the more CSS stuff, that's fine. And I'm just pointing out it does maintain content and presentation separation. It may not be obvious, but it does. It's, you know, CSS still works, everything still works. Um, and uh, here's the fun part. So I created something called tagless. It uses name tag. And what it is, is a application environment for creating applications in a web page. So the point of components is that you can make them at runtime. So if you get an editor like the ace editor that runs in a web page, you can actually write an entire application in a web page without reloading your page. Not only can you write it, but you can write it and save it and send it or whatever without telling the server that supplied you that functionality what you were doing. So um, that's really important. Uh, I'll be giving a talk about this subject called the end of the read-only internet, but we're not gonna get into that right now. I do wanna demonstrate that the language works by showing you the most complex code yet written in it. Um, so you can do authoring in it, and you know what? I think you guys would be more interested in actually seeing it with your browser and that stuff. So, I open up a browser window, and I'm serving code locally, and boom. I'll reload it just to prove that it's a web page. So let's you log in, high quality encryption. So uh, basically all, everything you're about to see is private to the user. Um, there's an invite, and this is what I'm gonna be doing on July 4th. So the language is separate from all of this. I'm just demonstrating it for the fun of it here at the end. So I'll log in, and what it's doing now is bringing resources from a server, uh, including applications that I've written, blah, 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 and it will make a desktop. So um, here we see a launcher I wrote. This is all name tag 100%. If I looked at the source of the page, you'd see those script tags. However, I don't write the script tags anymore because this environment abstracts it yet a step further. So. I can open this up and it makes a web browser. This web browser is four pages of code. Um, it's loading it from the server now as a component and this is all written in name tag. Do you remember how I made a list and you could select on the list? Well, now you know how that's being made. It's not some crazy piece of code that you'll never understand that one guy wrote once that you'll never use again. It is in fact proof that these base concepts map. You see columns. Well, that's just another list. Each one of these columns is a list you may notice that it changes as I go over them, you see that that's changing? Well, that's because it's selectable. So what I have is a list of lists. Um, so anyway, this is pulling from a file system I wrote. Doesn't really matter for our demonstration. Uh, the point is that you can run applications right from this thing. So here we see something that I just call big list, very short application, and you can drag it. Drag and drop is something my system offers, and it nails it. It's the most powerful drag and drop available, period. It's universal anything to anything with no brains on your part required, which is really nice. So that's how that worked. Um, I can run it. And now we see we have this pop up. You saw how fast it popped up, but that was actually 500 items though. I don't know how many items it was. I can go down and you'll see it fills it in. So there we are at 499. I can select them, I can select all of them, but it was actually 500 items. So just for the fun of it, I'm gonna make 5,000 items. I'm gonna run it. I'm gonna open a application called Droplet which is designed to show you when things have been drag and drop. That's all it does, very simple piece of code. Notice that I can drop the application icon onto there, and then it shows me, hey, the application icon was dropped onto itself. So I'm gonna come back here and select everything. And now I'm gonna drag it to here. And indeed, that was 5,000 items drag and dropped between the two. Boom. Really, really, really fast. Um, so 
the code for that. How do you get that up to, I want to show 5,000 things in my web page. That sounds cool, because pagination isn't fun, right? I mean, it's not hard to send 5,000 pieces of data. A picture is bigger than 5,000 pieces of data, so we don't have a problem with getting a data down the line. We do have a problem with rendering 5,000 things. So, if we look at this example, uh, which is not written in Shimmel, it's written in normal HTML. First of all, notice that there is no script tag surrounding this. That's because the file itself is an implicit script tag. You'll never see script tags again looking in the system because they're implicit. But they're there. I won't get into what and how. Notice that I'm making a list with 5,000 items and that it has certain things like auto-scrollable. Here's selectable that you remember. So if I go back to it uh, and I select an item and then I scroll up, you'll notice that it keeps it on the page. Okay, well that was just that one option there. Uh, notice that I have key selectable, which makes the key work. I have drag selectable, which means that just by holding down Alt, I can do multi-selection. Okay, great. Um, drag, which is what made it draggable. So that one line made all 5,000 items draggable. Um, what is it printing for each item? Well, it's printing out high there, which is great. Uh, and then it has another list. So it's showing you a list within a list for the recursion. You'll notice then that you know, that's a list as well. What was the point? It's not just 5,000 items. It's 5,000 items with any degree of complexity inside it. So you could have 5,000 of these items that create an entire application for one and still have the same general speed. So you'll see you can go up and down and if I you know, do all this. So this uh, is optimized because of this line. Optimized height, 7015. Won't get into it too much, but this form of optimization requires a fixed height. I mean, I won't get into the why, but if you want to go from the top to the bottom and not make the stuff in the middle, then you have to know what the height of the items are. So this says that I want to optimize for height, that there's 70 big, right? And I want an overlap of 15, which means I want 15 items painted on either side so that, you know, if, if you scroll a little bit, it's not always updating. That line by itself optimized this program. I didn't have to change my source one bit. You write this code and you can make an optimized list from an unoptimized list with that one line. I don't know if there's any other environment that lets you apply optimization that way. They'll do it with two separate mechanisms, which means the code has to be refactored to achieve it. Here you change nothing. Why would you ever not optimize a list? Because some things you want to actually make all of them to begin with. I mean, what if each thing as you made it made a server call that said it was made? You want to make them right away, whatever. So, a UI components at the top. You all want these to be made right away. Optimization would just be overhead. So um, just to point it out, you'll see that, that if I change the size of this thing, it follows. That's all hitches. You'll see this thing at the bottom. We have desktop, applications, blah, blah, blah. Uh, debug, which of course shows you when something goes wrong in a program. So all of these are hitches working recursively to lay out your page. Great. So um, the only thing left to show you here close this stuff, uh, is how easy it is to make your own application. I'm going to open that up. I am going. Does this only work in Chrome? No, this, this, okay, good question. Chrome is 20 times faster mathematically than any other browser. So, name tag works in every browser, IE9, IE10, not IE8, I don't care about IE8, I'm so sorry if that hurts someone's feelings. <laughs> they also have bad memory management. So this, this wouldn't really work. However, everything else that works perfectly, except CSS is tinyly different in Firefox, for instance. So if I loaded this, it'd load perfectly in Firefox. The little menu box would be at the top, and I just didn't worry about fixing it. And because of the speed of Chrome, I recommend that people run this in Chrome. But there is no other uh, you know, necessity. I just do Chrome because it's fast. So what I'm gonna do is make a new file and then I'm going to rename it to test.app. I'm going to drag it. Notice that I can scroll while I'm dragging. Take that OSX. If you haven't ever thought of it before, it doesn't work. You have to put your thing up at the top and hope that it moves. Anyway, uh, it knew that this was a new app file, so it put a demonstration program in there for me. Uh, and I, I haven't gotten into some of the most exciting parts of this yet. I don't have time today. Maybe it'll be a different talk. Uh, so we can do that. There's nothing in it because there was nothing in my div. Okay, we see that. Well, I hate writing close tags. Okay, great. View class blue. 
And now, this would be, that would be an error, right? You all recognize that would be an error, because that would be considered JavaScript. It's a view. You, you can't have, because this, is, this text is a child of a view, it would be interpreted as JavaScript. So just to, I was just pointing that out again. So I have to put it in a span. OK, so I made this really cool application, and now I want to use it in my web page. What do I have to do? Well, that's the fun bit. I save it, close it, open a program called Exporter. Then I can drag the application to my list of applications to be exported, uh, choosing my options. Uh, I'll call it our test, click export. What it's doing now is fetching files from the server. So as I read them the first time, they get brought to the front. Then it gets put into a zip file, which is then downloaded. You see at the bottom it downloaded something. So I'll show it in the finder. I'll sort by date modified so we see what decompresses from it. Double click it, get a zip, four files with an index, double click, and boom. So that concludes the demonstration. Um, the website that I have gives examples. It actually shows this entire environment as a demonstration. No saving, it's static. And I look forward to putting this out open source uh, by July 4th. Uh, right, you can get a card up there if you want, or um, domalgebra.com. Uh, it's the name of my company. It's, if you think about you know, what I'm doing in the DOM, it's algebraic operations. It's duplicating something many times, um, 2x of something, 3n of something, whatever. So uh, in a moment of inspiration, I, I call the company DOM Algebra. The co project, of course, is called New Tech. What's your architecture support a, a single, single page no JavaScript app, I know, where you actually would have multiple views, but it would be a one-time load. Is a right, no, it, it requires JavaScript. Um, and this has always been intended for advanced web applications. Uh, so to do what you're saying, which I had thought about at one point, you would have to render it in a back-end environment and then take what renders out of it and have that as your final deliverable. So imagine making a list that then creates 10 objects then you read the DOM from the page on your back end by invoking Chrome and then getting into it, whatever. And then taking the output and making that be your output application. But that's somewhat circuitous for all the ways that you could do that. Why not just use PHP's templating option to do the same thing? Uh, it's good in AngularJS where you, you basically create one app and all, even if it has multiple pages, then you're just flipping between pages and not reloading. Well, I'm sorry, maybe I mistook your question. You want to be able to include multiple applications together. Is that what you're asking? One, one application that includes multiple pages. Sure, I'll show this. Um, it's what I call a deck. So there's another program here. Damien's just the name of a friend of mine, and it uh, has an error. <laughs> Sorry. If I opened it, I'd find out that I was just playing with it last night. So what I'll do is duplicate it. Duplicate the one we just ran. Uh, and I'll rename it to test2. Then I will drag both of those to the file editor. Right, so we see that I have test and test two. And in test two, I'll say test two. And now when I come back to my exporter, I will take this thing and uh, drop it in there. So now I have test and test two. I want to create a deck. I want the launcher to be uh, a basic topmost. Well, I'll say basic left is fine. Um, and this, this deck is just a little program in and of itself, so you can make as many of these as you want to. So uh, I hope this answers your question. If not, pardon me, so sorry. We have download one, go in here, and now you'll see that I have two applications with a launcher on the left to let me go between them. And in fact, I can drop work. So you'll see that even though it may be hard to see, did I, I didn't save it when I made that change. Pardon me. So I have to re-export it. Notice the buffer up here is buffering the output so that the write seems immediate, even though it writes to the server later on. Makes things very fast, very nice. Um, so I'll come back here, uh, re-export it. Um, I'm not showing some of the features, but that's OK.
So, um, I'm sorry, just one second and I'll answer that. Um, I don't like this. Sorry, it should have flipped between the two, but I'll get back to it. I was actually working on that last night, so it's not surprising. Um, I've been working on this project for about a year and six months full time. Um, I've been working with this concept for six years. I used to work for a company called Open Laszlo that produced something similar, but for Flash. And by similar, I mean nowhere near as powerful. Uh, HTML runtime, that's what made it possible. The speed of the new HTML runtimes lets me do stuff like that. Three times I've tried to create a desktop paradigm for the web page. And this is my last and most successful attempt, one that I think will actually stick. Um, but to answer, just to finish up your question, uh, had the gods been smiling on me, each one of these would have popped up your app there. Uh, oh, I know why. I know why it didn't work. I, I have to tell you now. Um, if you look at these, they are globally unique. You can take this code and put it in anyone else's page, and it's not just run, guaranteed to run. Why? Because it has UUIDs. If you look at the attributes, this is the editor for that file, so I can do cool things like you know change its color label, make it read only, whatever. But one of the attributes on it is UUID. And this UUID is what defines it. And that's why if we both write applications called test, they will work together. And that Can you is that key? Hmm? Does your application automatically. And so the problem is when I duplicated the file, it has the same UUID. And that's why we're not seeing it change. So if I come here and I erase it. Now, that doesn't have one. The old one has it. We come back here and export. And I'm so sure it'll work that I'm going to actually let it do it, not just gloss over it. But yeah, because they both have the same UUID, this thing was you know, showing the same application up here. When you removed the one, did it automatically generate a different one? When I compiled it next. Okay. So if it doesn't have a UUID, it has to make one. Now, I, again, I'm not showing you literally 20 features in this thing that make this sort of development really easy. All I'm doing is showing you the most simple program possible. Just remember that all of these programs are themselves in this application. So this thing is a demonstration of how complex it can get. It's like, you know, I think four files, whatever. But um, let's go back. That include each other. And so there's facilities for including applications inside of applications and keeping the UUIDs right, all that stuff. And now we see test two and then the other one doesn't pop up. And there's a reason for that too. I'm surprised you can talk and demo at the same time. And <laughs> yeah, I, in this case, that's just CSS. But I want to point out that I was writing those deck launchers um, just recently. So the idea of exporting is old. The idea of decks is new. And so I probably just have some CSS issue with how the launcher sits next to the other launcher. And so you see one, and the other one is being pushed underneath. Anyway, did that answer your question? Mm -hmm. cool. Any other questions? Okay. Just you would erase the UID and then give it. It would regenerate it. So oh, okay. let's look back and see. This red one is the one we changed uh, that has UUID X9, whatever. And you know, for all I know, uh, I think it is a CSS issue. but as these things normally are. But we can always go back and get rid of them both and, uh, and apply. Um, there's a lot more here, obviously, going on, workflows and messaging and, and all types of stuff. But um, the ones I normally export, the ones I'm sure that will work, would be big lists. So we'll come over here, take that big list thing, which is what I tested with. Great. So we come here, and we see test two and big list. Get rid of that one. Export it. If it doesn't work. So the idea, by the way, is that drag and drop works there. So when you have a deck, you're able to start a drag in one application, hover over its name in the launcher, and complete the drag in the other one. That's for mobile. So imagine having five applications. You wrote one of them. Someone else wrote the other four. Say you're doing metric conversion, and you want to be able to drag and drop metric conversion terms from an app someone else wrote into yours to do something totally different. You then create an export as a deck with their app, and then you can start a drag in their app, go to your app name, and finish it in yours. And so it's supposed to be a method by which uh, you can gain utility by combining applications into a single application flexibly. And so there's use for that all over the place in terms of um, managing large projects. 
and uh, getting value out of what you've already written. If it's written in this form, then not only you, but the entire world can gain benefit from an API you give out. If you have a product, your business or service has a product, advertising it in this way means that your customers can fulfill their needs without asking your development team to do it. And that's important. That's really important. Because we know our development teams only have so many hours in the day. So now the test two isn't there. I'll deal with it. It's absolutely a CSS problem in the bottom, and I'm sure that another launcher would work. Anyway, I'm just showing that uh, that you know it, things can be put here just like they're there. So it's a nice big list. It does whatever. Um, any other questions? So what's what, what's the long term goals of, of this whole thing? I mean, you see everybody using this instead of. Well, I am going to release on July 4th, so I might as well put it out there. So that people won't have to use that HTML anymore? Well, of course. The, the end of the read-only internet means that everyone is both the creator and the consumer. So in today's internet, you are only a consumer of what you've been given. And so a kid who's interested in expanding or working with scientific data or working with a cool app or making fart sounds has no way to integrate with the data he has in the page. So I'm giving away a lot of my pre-launch here, but secure programmable social media. That's the end goal of this. The ability to set up communication networks where people can create content for those networks uh, without the people in the middle being responsible for it in any way. Because the entire application process, when I downloaded a zip, it did not go back to the server to get that. That operation happened in the browser. This is the only way in which you can guarantee secure development. Anything else requires that your, your intellectual property be revealed to the people who give you the service. In this service, and this is specifically designed for this, at no point in time does anything you do become uh, available to the person who gives you the service. So I could give everyone in the room an account, and I have no ability to tell what you're doing with it. You could write an application and give it to five of your best friends, and I can't tell you even wrote an app, much less gave it to them. I don't know who your friends are. I don't know any of that stuff. So I'm sure you all see it as topical and relevant, not just because of the last month, but because of the development of what social media means to people, to our society. Um, there's uh, a dangerous trend, in my opinion dangerous, perhaps it's not, uh, towards private companies uh, knowing a lot about people, not because they're providing a service, but simply because the technology they're offering does it. There is no reason why I should give my information to a company to say hi to 50 of my friends. There is no mathematical reason. There's no technical reason. Uh, it doesn't exist. So that's what I'll be. You know, that's that's what all of this was going towards. Yes, I wrote the language, but the language was designed to support the security paradigm that must exist to have a free flow of information in our society. And you don't have freedom if you can't control what runs, not just what gets said through something running. In other words, you have to be able to design the application to have freedom. I mean, if I say, here's an app that lets you post, then you get to send words in it, but you don't even know when the application changed, or what it does, or if it will change. In a system like this, you can be absolutely sure of what you're running, because you created it, fine, not everyone's going to have time to create things, but you can do signing in this, too, so you can be sure that it's your friend's application that's doing something. You can be sure of what you're running and how it runs, and so the browser is not a way of viewing websites. It's a computation engine that happens to have all of this inside of it. I'm no graphic designer. Give me you know, a couple weeks and I can make this look like everyone expects it to look like. What this does is proves the point. So uh, what I'll be doing is putting a Kickstarter launch around these concepts where I'll be open sourcing the runtime for people to learn and use in the context of their own projects and within the context of something like this that lets them create without any other tools, without any requirement that they uh, agree to a company's morals, that they agree to oversight. And of course, if you have a kid, something he says or does could get him kicked out of Princeton. There's not a mother around who doesn't agree wholeheartedly that they want their child to be educated, to learn programming, and to talk securely. And I personally only see one way through that maze, simply because the web browser must be the way in which this content is delivered. No one's going to use something that's not in a web browser in 2013. So. Uh, if any of you happen to have some other idea of how it worked, but, uh, that last little bit is between us friends until July 5th. Any other questions? Cool. I'd be really interested in, you know, if you come up with questions later, feel free to get in touch. There's a sign up page, uh, which I got to work recently. It turns out that it wasn't working for a little while. But you
you can go to that webpage and there's a sign up. Put your email there. That means you will know when I start giving out accounts. As a matter of fact, this whole thing's done on Emperor, Nginx, WSGI, high quality implementation ready to go. I have not started giving out accounts yet. But when I do, and I'm not sure you know, how I'll pay for a million people using it right off the bat, because I'm not doing advertising. Um, but uh, you guys would be the first to know, certainly. That's, that's the whole point is to find interested people in the community who can understand the impact of something like this and uh, use it in not only the way it was intended, but in the spirit of achievement. I mean, there are tools like Angular, and there are tools like, uh, like um, Java or other platforms that enable people to write really neat apps. They are not a full statement of security in our society and user control. This is a mechanism by which the user always has control, and that's a philosophical point, not a technical one. It's the way that I wrote it. It's the way that I intended to be used. So take the base language, use it any way you like. But a group of people who understand what I'm going for can help see the same thing I am. And because I can solicit user contributions, I know that I'm not the only one working on this project. I'm the only one working on this project right now. But I could have hundreds of thousands of people sending me applications, and I could be choosing which ones are the best or not, or I could be setting up means by which they distribute it to each other. Um, this isn't designed to grow. And it's the only web page I know of that has this capacity. It's not designed to grow at the speed I can code. It's designed to grow at the speed the world can code it, like Wikipedia. So um, again, I'd love it if anyone gets in touch with questions and just signs up on the page so that you can know when things go out and um, how you intend to use it. That can inform how and what I prepare it as. You know, um, how do I deliver? How do I deliver it as a download? How do I license it? Um, you know, do I just do MIT? Do I make it available under three different licenses? Do I uh, address issues of clarity, which might be very understandable to me and it doesn't come through for someone else? You know, uh, I may not be aware of what's simple and what's difficult with this. So one thing to note is there's not a lot of documentation. I do have some. Um, the good thing is it's just components. So I can document this by a list and say, hey, here's a quick reference list. This is what it does. So it's a linear proposition to document it. But that's a lot of what the Kickstarter project's about. Um, I've used my personal savings to get to this point, and my wife's okay with it because she she's listened to me rave about this enough that she feels as if this could be you know a thing, and I think it is important. But to give this the treatment that it deserves, I have to go farther than just me, obviously. And it'd be great if I had another two years to sit at home and do nothing but this, which is what I've done the last year. So um, that's all I can say. So I certainly hope that society at large, which means programmers. I mean, literacy is programming in, in this day and age. You know, Literacy used to be reading and writing, and if you could read and write, then you would be someone who understood how to work with law, how to disseminate ideas, how to learn and take advantage of new trends. Well, uh, in these days, it's programming, and everyone in this room represents uh, a point of impact in a society that has seen increasing concentration of skill. Well, let's turn that back around. It's just a technological problem with a technological solution. That's all that's on my mind. Thanks, guys. I think there was someone else who wanted to talk, and I don't want to get in the way of them. Although, I'm sorry, I've gone over. Oh, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm so sorry. It's our own fault. You can do the next time. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think it's a great idea. I think thanks for presenting it to our group. And uh, 